Bill was challenging me to say something about this document that I sent you. I, I don't want to make a historical lesson on the um, creeds, the, the main part of this, but I'm happy to just remind you really what I already sent you. <clears throat> um, so first, you should see the, my creeds document on your screen. This is what I sent you in the email. Um, first of all, the, the Book of Concord does include a section. At, it's right at the beginning called the ecumenical creeds. And by ecumenical, they mean universal. These are things that maybe not all, but, but the main Christian denominations believe these things. Um, and they are the Apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian creeds. Now, it turns out that the Apostles' Creed is one we use most often in our worship, and that's what gonna, we're going to talk about today. Um, but it is not, as its name implies, the oldest. Um, it, it was not written by the Apostles, although there was an early church, there was a, um, I'm sorry, a, a Middle Ages um, tradition that the, the, there they had divided the Apostles' Creed into 12 sentences, and therefore they attributed each sentence to one of the Apostles. But that's, it's just not possible for it to have been written by them. Um, it, it appears much later uh, than the Apostles. They, they all died in the first century. Um, so, so what is it? Well, around the time of a, a, about 150 AD, so in the middle of the second century, a creed was being used in Rome uh, as a baptismal rite. And so this, this thing that I have shown you there called the Roman creed was used when you baptized and we do the same thing with the Apostles' Creed. When, we, when we're baptizing uh, up at the font, uh, we repeat the Apostles' Creed as, as the demonstration of the faith in which this child is being baptized. Um, and as I said, it's recognizable. Most of the sentences that make up this creed uh, found their way into the Apostles' Creed. Um, sometime over the next 100 to 200 years, from 150 to mid-300s, uh, this thing called the Apostles' Creed was created. And it, it still maintains, it, its main purpose was a baptismal creed. Bill mentioned the Nicene Creed, and I thought that that was somewhat interesting also. There's a different reason for the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is on the last page of my document there. Uh, Doug, excuse me. Go ahead. When, you, when you say baptismal creed, do you mean one that is affirmed at baptism? Well, it, it's, yes. Uh, we, we use the formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We actually say those words. So, the, in, in, and also we read the Apostles' Creed during that, that service. It's part of our liturgy. These are words that are used by the congregation to express what it is we believe as we baptize a new, as a new member joins our congregation, we all take the time to say, this is our belief. And you say it was developed as a baptismal creed. So back then, in the second century, they would have it would have been read, and they would have affirmed their their belief in it. Yes, that's right. The Roman Creed was a baptismal rite. That's mm -hmm. right. It was used in the service, and I'm saying that we we've pretty much done the same thing with the Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. Um, now, Luther takes the Apostles' Creed and puts it in the Catechism, which means it's also, it's got another role for us. It's got a teaching role. Um, 
But let, let me finish what I was going to say about the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is a little different. It exists for a, uh, I don't want to make it, I'm not trying to be negative. It's a political reason that it exists. Um, in the early church, there was uh, two primary heresies that were causing the church some difficulty. The Arian, the Arian and Gnostic um, heresies. The Arians believed that Jesus was a human being, not God, but he was blessed by God. So he did amazing things and, and, and exhibited all kinds of power, but he was a man. And it was God working through him that accomplished what you, what you can see in the scriptures. So the Arian heresy is Jesus is a man, not God. The Gnostic, uh, is, the Gnostic heresy is the opposite. Um, Jesus is God, not man. God would not um, get down into the dirt. And, and, and uh, godly things are not earthly things. So what we're seeing in the scripture, it appears as if Jesus is interacting with the world. Uh, I mean, I may not be expressing that well, but he... Um, he is spirit. He is he is God, and 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 so he he would not get his hands dirty. And he certainly wouldn't die on a cross. That's way too dirty for, for the Gnostics. So you had these two different heresies. And the Council of Nicaea uh, comes together, um, being called by 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 the way, was not called by the Pope. It was called by uh, someone uh, on the on the uh, eastern side of the uh, of the Christian Church uh, in the Constantinople. Yeah, yes. yeah, in that area. Um, anyway, they address specifically the questions of these two issues. Uh, Jesus is, and I, I put it in bold, just. You, you know these words because you've heard the Nicene Creed your whole lives, but begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Jesus was God is the point. That's a, that's a political statement by the Nicene Creed to address the, um, the question of the Arians. And then to hit the other one, was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man. There you go. He was a man, was crucified. He, did, he definitely died. He suffers and is buried in the ground. This is an attack on the Gnostic heresy. That was the primary reason for the Nicene uh, council. There, there were other issues being addressed, as a lot of church meetings, they, 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 their agenda was broad, but the, the most important one was dealing with, with, this, with this question. Um, uh, that, that's, that's really all I wanted to say on these, because I don't, I don't want to take the whole time on this. Bill, did I address your question? That was very good. Thank you, Doug. That was very helpful. Okay. Um, let me change the chair one more time and get to the actual uh, point for uh, today. And now it's not interesting. Here it is, small catechism. Hopefully you can see the small catechism. Uh, I've sent this PDF file uh, to you several times. Um, the, the creed is addressed uh, as the second part of the uh, small catechism. Notice again, Luther says, as the head of the family should teach it in a simple way to his household. Small catechism is primarily intended for uh, family devotionals. 
this is what parents should make sure their kids know at a minimum. Um, and the first article, the, the actual um, title creation was not in Luther's original, but it has become traditional to list it this way. The subject is creation and the actual creed says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker or creator of heaven and earth. And then following Luther's pattern in, these, um, in the catechism, well, what does that mean? I believe that God has made me and all, all creatures. It has given me my body, soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason, and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support his body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Um, it did occur to me just as I was in the middle of reading that, that I, Tim had asked us to consider where the gospel is in this, um, in the creed. I do want to get to that question, and probably I should have done it before we d d dove into this. That's all right. I, I forgive you. Uh, I did have a thought, though. Okay. When you were reading this, um, you had said that the Luther is writing his commentary primarily for the the family uh, who would be subject to uh, all the hard difficulties of life. And you notice how all of this is centered on God's protection and provision, mm -hmm. as opposed to um, a, a lofty theological discourse on the greatness of the Almighty Father. Y yes, it's very practical. Practical, pragmatic, yeah. Um, by the way, it, it isn't exactly clear. I. I I think Luther, when he first wrote the small catechism, if you read his preface, um, by the way, the preface is included in this document that I sent you. Um, it, it is about the family, but it's also about the parish. As, as, as the Lutheran church began to, to the transition from control by Rome to control by this new organization, they had some catching up to do. And, and some of the parishes were less um, competent. Yeah, less competent. Uh, so it was, it was a, a primer that anybody could use, including a, a, uh, uh, a, a lay person or a pastor who wondered, well, what can I say about this? Um, now, eventually, there, there were two documents. The large catechism was also created after this, this small catechism. And then the issue is clearly directed at the teacher or the pastor. It's, it's kind of like the instructor's manual for this small catechism. You got a small catechism, which is the book, the primer. Now, how do you teach the book? And that's what the large catechism does. Um, but anyway, we're, we're, we've looked at one of the tools that Martin Luther brings to take it out of Latin and bring it to the masses. This oh, yeah. great oh, yeah. small catechism, what a tool to learn about God. And that first article on just that we have to maintain a high view of God because he created everything. Yes, but, but notice that it, it's one thing to say that God is the creator of everything. 
and, and you're looking outside yourself and maybe that's great. Even with wonder, you're looking at all the things that God has created. Heaven and earth, the, the line says. Heaven and earth, that's all that broad sky you see at night when you look up at the stars and whatever. It's magnificent. But Luther points to himself. I like that. It's, it, it, you can get lost in looking at the stars, but Luther says, God created me. I'm a creature of God. So he's pointing to himself. I am a creature of God. Everything about me is a creature of God. Everything. So you can describe the, the, you, you know, the parts of your body. You can describe your senses. You can describe the way you think. He takes care of me, as Tim pointed out. There's care here. And what does that mean? Well, you, you need to feed and clothe people. Parents feed and clothe their children. God feeds and clothes the family. The family at that time was usually uh, a little bit more um, in in agricultural in its notice that we've got here not only wives and children of course but land animals you got fields i mean you, you've got a uh martin would used to would would give um katie luther credit for being such, such a wonderful husband not you know the the the, the animal husbandry she she was she was just good at at the economics required of, of running his his operation. Uh, it was large. Um, it was it was problematic in that he would sometimes bring home a, a dozen students. And remember, this is a period of time before you have a, a refrigerator in your kitchen where you can just grab a few extra frozen pizzas or something for the group that's just arrived. So anyway, so the point is God is providing, as a parents provide for their children, God is providing for a family. All that I need to support this body and life. And then defense against danger. The evil was a very real thing to Martin Luther and, and the presence of the devil. Um, God is active in that defense. He defends me against all danger, guards and protects me from all evil. Now, why does he do all these things? Remember, <laughs> we're Lutherans. So it's not because we deserve it. Why does he do these things? Because he loves us out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. It's not because of me that he does all these things for me. Where have I heard that before? It's because of him. Yes, it's, it's core. It's core to everything Luther does. Anytime he can mention it, he will say, remember, you don't get any points for this. You're the same. You never get points yeah. in, in a Lutheran uh, setting. Um, so what are we supposed to do with this then? You've just been told God created you and everything about your life. He cares for all the details that, you know, down to your shoelaces. He cares about everything. Well, you uh, could thank him. And that's the last line of this. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. That's the part I get. Not because if I do these things, he will respond by giving me all these good things. No, it's the other way around. Because he has done all these good things, I owe thanksgiving. My, what I owe God is always thanksgiving. 
not because it creates the good, but because the good has already been provided. It's just that simple. Um, <clears throat> other thoughts on this one? Okay. Now, Tim, you asked the question last week, is, is the gospel in the creed? And it occurred to me that your question arose because of something that was flowing in our discussion. We had already said that we, were, we had studied the Ten Commandments for two weeks. And we said in that Ten Commandments discussion that we can't keep these commandments. The nature of the commandments, and especially the nature of Luther's explanation of each one of those commandments, made it impossible for me to satisfy God. God tells me what I want to do, and the, and the honest answer is, I can't do it. That's not possible for me to do it. And so what's the, what's the solution to this terrible situation? I know that God wants me to do certain things, but I don't do them. And the answer is the gospel. That would be the normal way for us to set this up. Here's the problem, the law describes your problem as a sinner. You can't keep the commandments. The solution to that situation is the gospel, right? Sure, and grace. And grace, okay, now. Good news, good news. Yeah, the good news of the gospel. Now, Tim asked, okay, Luther's thinking along the same lines here, but notice what he's done. He said, you've got the commandments. They create a problem for you. You are condemned by them. The solution is the Apostles' Creed. So if the normal solution we look for is the gospel, Luther offers us the Apostles' Creed as the solution. It's logical for Tim to ask, okay, I'm, I'm looking for the gospel. Where is the gospel in this thing we call the Apostles' Creed? If it really is going to be the solution for my problem with the Ten Commandments, then I ought to be able to say here or there or whatever. So that's why I sent you uh, the email. I don't know if you read far enough down into my email, uh, but I, I said, let's start first by maybe describing what the gospel is. Um, it's, it's not a simple one, one sentence thing. And some of the verses I sent you go off in different directions. Um, so did I do this right? Yeah. I think you can see my email account. I, is, is it, pardon? I, I see my name. It, well, that's because you and I <laughs> bug each other all week about this stuff. Okay, Here, here's the stuff I was talking about. Uh, if, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna describe what the gospel, how the gospel's in the adult elective, I mean, I mean in, in the Apostles' Creed, we, we need to figure out what, what, what is it? What is exactly the gospel? Right. It, it's, it's good news. And, and I, I purposely chose, I, I just simply did a word search in the New Testament on the word gospel. And I came up with this half dozen different verses that refer to a righteousness that is by faith. That's Romans 1. 
In Galatians 3, he refers to the gospel in relation to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Kind of underline the word blessing there. Uh, gospel is a blessing. The gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That's the description from Ephesians. Well, there's a position is there too, Doug. Yeah. You also were included in Christ. Right. That's a new position. Included in children of God. And we say to a child when they're being baptized and the pastor uses the oil on the forehead, you are marked with the cross of Christ. Hmm. Okay. So this, this sentence uses that, that, that imagery marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Um, another verse from Ephesians, the gospel, the Gentiles are through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So the gospel includes us with Israel. We are grafted into the people of God, the promise that Abraham was given. Yeah, it starts with our redemption and continues on through life with these benefits, so to speak. Right. So it, it did occur to me, Tim, that that we we don't have a, a simple definition of what it means to be what the gospel is. Um, the closest that I come to is uh, is the one down here at the bottom. Um, the, the word gospel is not in this sentence uh, or in these sentences, but the idea that I am righteous because God has made me righteous. That would be included in any definition of gospel that I would offer. Yeah, it's a component of the gospel, isn't it? A very important component. Maybe, maybe the one you have to start with to make us holy so we can stand before God. But then it goes on, of course, to give us eternal life and all, all that that implies. Right, yes. So, so okay, Th that's the problem of the question. Um, when you say, where is the gospel? You need to decide what, what, well, what it is that you're looking for. Well, sorry, I gave you a problem. No, no, that's <laughs> perfect. Well, one of the aspects that I take of the gospel is that God makes a new covenant with us that supersedes the Abrahamic and uh, Davidic covenant, and he gives us a way to be with him for eternal life. Okay. Another very important component. Right. Covenants uh, are God's promises, and our faith is in those promises. That's, that's an important part of this. Now, on your screen, in fact, I, I think because the text is smaller, I'm going to switch the, let's now go specifically back to this small catechism stuff, but now I can't find it. Yeah, if, if you'll notice that Luther did a great job of adding these components we've been talking about. Yeah, yes, yeah, so and that's what I wanted to point out. It, Tim said, can we find the uh, in the Apostles' Creed, can we find the gospel? And so if you, to be specific, there are the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now, if, if you're going to limit yourself to just those words or the words down here, in the second article, which we didn't do yet, we're going to do that next week. If you limit yourself just to the creed sentences, you might have a little more difficulty <laughs> finding the answer to Tim's question. But if you add these additional sentences that Luther suggests 
are uh, there are his explanation for what's going on here. Um, you can find, I think it'll be easier to find elements of grace, righteousness provided by God. Um, it says, uh, if you'll highlight the area under the second article. Yeah. It says, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father. That's very important to establish. Right. True man, born of the, is my Lord. That's the first uh, key point in the gospel, that Jesus is our Lord. And what has he done? He has redeemed me. So it's, who is he? What has he done? Right. And redemption is a big part of the second article, which we, we yes. will spend some time ne next week uh, dealing with that. Um, it's just that redemption doesn't really show up in the text of the second article. No, but it, it, it as Luther points out, but because Luther made the point, I, why say the paragraph? What, 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 why is that stuff important? It, it's because of what it accomplishes. Well, it establishes Jesus' credentials to be our Savior, our Redeemer. What, what does, Tim? That part his, you've highlighted right there. Oh, his son, our Lord, yes. Everything in that establishes his credentials. Right. He, especially the ascension into heaven sits on the right hand. That's the exaltation of Christ. Yeah. That's now, who we worship. Remember my discussion about the Nicene Creed. It, it is kind of amazing that, that the, the Nicene Creed was necessary. Um, I don't know what other interpretation. You see, that's that part of the sentence. His only son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Doesn't that address the issues raised by the Arians and the Gnostics? But maybe it didn't address it clean enough with double underlining you know so that's why in the Nicene Creed you get the language very God from very God uh, and they use the word incarnate yeah I get the impression that this wasn't written with that particular heresy yeah. in, in mind that's right they, they were not thinking that somebody was going to nitpick yeah on the question that Jesus was the son of God right the, the Apostles' Creed is holding up Christ as uh, able and worthy to be our Savior. Right. And this is why. Right. And then later, someone asks some questions that could go, go down either of the two heresies. Yeah. Uh, well, was he really a human being? Was he really a God? And, and those questions needed to be answered later. And that's why the Nicene Creed is used. Um, I think in one of our classes, we, we actually looked at the Athanasian Creed one time. It, it's a much longer creed. It's very difficult to use in worship. Uh, Pastor Menser is on the call. Pastor, do we ever use the Athanasian Creed in worship? You don't hear. Um, recommended use of the Athanasian Creed is usually recommended for Holy Trinity Sunday. When is it? For Holy Trinity Sunday, Sunday oh, after Pentecost. Pentecost. So once a year. You, you yeah. Pull out, pull out the long creed. Yeah. And back back in my early days of ministry when I thought I knew everything about everything, I threw that into the service and on the way out, many congregational members said, why did you make us do that? <laughs> why, did you, why did you make us do that? Well, yeah, I guess it's is, really long. <laughs> there, I don't know if then you actually used the version. The, the, the last sentence also turns people off because there's a sentence that says the gist is, is something along the lines and if you don't believe all this stuff, you are condemned. <laughs> that doesn't cover well either, does it? This, you know, this is, this is the Christian faith. 
and without it, you go to hell. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm being facetious with the actual language, but that's that last sentence is pretty blunt. Right. You right. believe exactly. this, or you're 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 gone. And and most people, oh, that's 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 a, just a little too blunt. Well, the reformers threw uh, the uh, term that anathema. You yeah. are anathema, which yeah. means the same thing, right? Yeah, that's true. You're, you're it, it, condemned. And when you read the confessions, there's going to be a paragraph describing what the belief is. And then there's going to be uh, maybe, uh, usually it's not as long, but there's a list of people who have other beliefs. And the word anathema is used, condemnations. Um, yeah, we, you know, we the Lutherans were pretty hard on various they folks. Um, they were fighters. They were not, not only the Roman, and not only the Roman Catholics. Um, the, we were, we had trouble with other uh, Protestant denominations because of various decisions they were making regarding very certain theological questions. Um, the you know, what's exactly going on in, in, in communion was a big one. We tend to be more Catholic in our understanding of what's going on in communion. There are many Protestants who believe it's just a, a remembrance. It's a memorial activity. And the Lutherans say, no, no, no. He's present in the, he's present in the elements. And that caused a difference in the church. Um, anyway, we are near the end of this discussion. Um, we have two more articles to discuss. Um, think of them both as what I suggested David Wesley was doing. Um, what's important to know about you as an individual is God loves you. And these two articles, both of them, are addressed at that question. God loves you enough that you have been redeemed. God loves you enough that you have been sanctified. And these last two paragraphs are going to describe how that happens, what that work looks like. So I'm going to say, change the share one more time time and move to the Lord's Prayer. So um, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. And oh, yes, I, even though I encourage you all to pray, um, for the purposes of the recording, I put you on mute so that we don't get background noise. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So reminder, you're on mute. If you want to speak, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, Pastor, before you came in, um, someone asked about the fellowship and timing. The church is going back to in-person on March 21st. Uh, Kathy and the group discussed this morning about when the fellowship might start serving breakfast. <clears throat> I encourage you, in-person breakfast. I encourage you to talk to Kathy. I won't, I won't really try to speak for her, but what the gist of it is, March 21st is too early. Um, we, we can't, be, because unlike church, where it, it's a one-time use, and then everybody goes home for a week, in the fellowship, we have turnover on the use of the tables. And so she's saying, let's wait probably another month until the weather's warm enough that we can open the doors 
improve the ventilation. We'll still wash the tables. That's not a big deal. But at the moment, we can't, we can't provide for good ventilation. So I think she's thinking about another month. Um, yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. Well, Kathy's yeah. very careful, so. Yeah. I go by her lead. Same here. <laughs> so any other comments or questions for the good of the course? How, how are people's, um, well, I don't know how to ask it. I've had my second vaccine. Any, anybody else getting vaccinated? I'm on well, hopefully at the Bonton. Yeah, I got a vaccination. And my okay. Carol got Carol got her first and second. Okay. And I got my first shot. Okay. Yeah, that, that, I'm just hoping that that changes the game a, a lot. I'm really hoping. Yeah, I think it will. I'm being very, I'm being very optimistic. It'd be nice to be able to just have normal conversations with folks without the darn masks. But anyway. I got directly exposed last week, uh, or no, a week and a half ago at this point now. I got tested twice and I came up negative. I have zero idea how I tested negative, but um, oh. I am fine. I'm getting a blood test at work because we're doing a blood drive. So I might be able to see if I have the antibodies, which I'm, I, I have to. Um, if that's the case, but, um, I know my dad has both the shots. Um, my mom is waiting because she's, well, isn't if, healthcare. Like you, if, if you do end up with the antibodies, <laughs> then that means you, in essence, have either, you must have survived a non-symptomatic exposure. Yes. And, and um, is, is, isn't that is every bit as good as being vaccinated? I would think no, so. It, it, but. They ask for a vaccination on top of the COVID, so you don't spread it. The part of the vaccination uh, qualities is that you will not spread it. And one of my friends, he uh, from college, uh, he works for the state uh, liquor store system, and he found out he was uh, positive by giving a blood test also. So oh. that's one way. He didn't even know he had it, but... Uh, he got a thing back from his blood. He's a monthly giver, and that's how he found out that he was COVID positive. So if I understood what you just said, Bill, even having had the disease and survive it, you still can be a transmitter of the disease. Dr. Fauci is recommending that's everyone who has had COVID to get the vaccination also. Do okay. not let that go. Okay. Yeah, that's what I heard on TV as well. well. I don't mind saying that, you know, there's a, a well, I'd like a, to answer to have a, some foolproof way of uh, understanding the, the transmission. Yeah, because uh, I'm. I wasn't even sure. I wasn't even sure, though, that they had agreed that if you had the vaccine, you you can or can't transmit the disease. I have well, heard that flip flop. This a is lot. brand new. They are finding out in preliminary tests that the vaccination does prevent you from spreading it. And that's one of the reasons to get it also. Well, that's then, huge. And this is, again, I'm being very optimistic. This is good news then on the mask front mm -hmm. because the mask then becomes superfluous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at some point. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is not what is providing anybody security, either me or the other people. Mm -hmm. Providing that security well, is the vaccine. In, in Idaho, just yesterday, parents were encouraging their children to burn all the masks because <laughs> uh, they don't believe yeah, in I have a feeling that's more of a protest. Well, right, that's a, a freedom protest. There. Correct. I, I understand the inclination. I, I definitely understand the inclination to burn the damn mask. But. <laughs> right, but we have variants going on and other things we don't know about. So yeah. it's always better to err on the side of caution. The other thing about this is, and it's hard to measure this one, is everything is down. We, we, there's less flu. There's less cold. Yes, that's right. So 
our isolation has been miserable, but but it, it, it does prevent us from becoming. becoming. Um, Nobody it, complains of anybody's bad breath anymore. <laughs> no, no bad breath. Yeah, so. I smell my own bad, bad breath worse if I wear the mask. So that's yeah. why I have it. But um, I just need to have better hygiene, I guess. So that's a personal. You have to floss more. No, yeah, floss it. every day. <laughs> yes. well, folks, all right good talking with you all i'm going to be sending you a link if you want to watch this whole thing over again um i do know i do know that there are a couple members of our group that can't be here on sunday morning so they watch the recording so see you all bye thank you doug see you be safe be blessed thank you doug yeah. great job bye